Ah. That's adorable. Also, we're we're live, Miss Anne. We're live on on Twitch. I mean, so. Ah. Uh. Hey, all right. Ooh, whoa, my face game is so off center. One second. <laughs> I'm also very close to myself. There we go. More in tune. Sorry, guys. I uh, I was setting up my uh, my setup yesterday, which is redundant. Um, and my uh, I accidentally smacked my face cam. So now I'm adjusting it. There we go. That's a little bit better. You can still see some debris behind me that I still have to clean up. Good morning, Reaper people. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Happy Monday morning to everyone. Back to work, right? Let's see what we got. Happy National Pineapple Upside Down Cake Day. Oh, I love pineapple upside down cake. Actually, because my man is like awesome man, he got me um, truffles from the local bakery and chocolate chocolate shop last night for dessert. Um, and one was a pineapple coconut truffle, and it was amazing. So this is this is tasty. I love pineapple upside down cake. So it's uh, and it's not on diet for me anymore. Uh, so <laughs> I'm just glad I don't have access to pineapples easily at this point. <laughs> or you would totally have made me want to make some. Uh, good morning, Cybstorm and Anki and Nomad Zeke and Bandar and Numbat and everybody. Um, Cybstorm, we switched times. Uh, because I am now on the West Coast, so it's quite early for me, and since I have to get the small dog up and empty her out, uh, in the mornings, um, we, I just didn't think I could actually make it online and looking civilized by 9am, uh, unless I got up really, really early, uh, which would totally put David's and I's uh, schedules off kilter. So, happily, Reaper was willing to shift the time to 11.30, so be, be ready for 11.30 rather than 11 Central USA time. Um, and that's just an adjustment since I, I moved out here to the, the far side of the world. Oh yeah, we need to change that on the Twitch page. Um, so make a note, Justin, to remind John of that if he's not watching. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, we, we tried it. Well, you know, this is the problem, guys, in the age of the new social media. And I've run into this with my Patreon, too is that you've got so many most social media platforms that you're trying to promote on and keep your stuff up to date on and it's easy to like forget one, right? Like your YouTube is updated or your Twitch isn't or vice versa or you forget to post to Instagram or you, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, like it's gotten so complicated. So we apologize. And now that we know we can make a, a little to-do point um, and try to make sure that gets uh, fixed. All of our scheduling is kind of flexible anyway per ed. So, but we try to stay consistent so for you guys can plan. Hello, Threads of Fate. Hello, Xanifer. Uh, banana bread. Oh, that's so good. Yeah, not a good choice for computer eating, Bandari. I could see that because, uh, or Bandar, because uh, crumbly, right? Crumbs everywhere. <laughs> also buttery. <laughs> I could see how banana bread would be, banana bread would be uh, fraught with peril. So I'm so excited, guys. Like, I got my office like 99% set up now. So I can feel like I could actually work in this place. It is not a total wreck. There are a couple things that need to be stored in the closet, like just a little bit, but otherwise like it's here, it's unpacked and I feel like I still have room, <laughs> which is very important if you have figmentia and you want to uh, continue to acquire things, <laughs> models specifically, you know, more bus, like I need more bus. But yes, happy Monday, Threads of Fate. Happy Monday. Happy Monday, Taz Lynch. It's good to see you. 
All right, so we're gonna do some corrosion effects, guys. Here, let me see what I've got. I wanted to check on something. Hmm, I'll need to make that a little later. I'm working on a project kind of for later in the week also for you guys. I actually did a lot of Reaper model prep last night since I unpacked everything and I could. Um, so I think later this week, we might work on something special that I might do a number of tutorials on. Um, I have a frost giant queen and she's resin instead of the bones one. So I actually wanted to paint her up really nice. Uh, so we might do some tutorials on her. Cause I was thinking of doing crazy things like tartan, uh, which would not really, you know, other models, uh, might not be suitable given she's supposed to be Norse and not Celtic, but they're so close. I'm like, I could get away with a tartan. <laughs> and maybe some freehand on the back. Um, but yeah, so hey, yes, yes, yes. Hello, hello, hello. Hi, Sharky. All right, so first of all, we're going to do some rust, though. We're not going to do, we're not going to do a special project today. We're going to do, well, it's, it, every project is a special project, right? All right, so now everybody's here. Let's go to minicam. All right, we have columns. I actually really like these columns. They're kind of cool. Um, you can put statues on top of them if you want, like, a looming terrain, or you could put the archway up here, like we make uh, we make an archway and I have it somewhere, but I don't have it close to hand. But you know the one I'm talking about is like kind of like makes an arch and it's normally on stairs, but you can easily with the bones version, clip it off and make this a doorway with an arch above it um, pretty easily. So that can be nice. You can also line up a bunch of these and make a colonnade um, like in a garden. Like if you put them close together, you can block line of sight pretty well with them um, or make an impenetrable barrier for your PCs that they have to go around. Uh, or your gaming models, of course. But uh, yeah, they, and they, they were minimal uh, mold line removal really on them. Like there's a little bit, you can see I didn't clean the top one off, um, but it runs right down the side. So it's really easy to clean off and trim these guys up to make them look nice. Um, but somebody asked, um, hey, McKnight, how's it going? Uh, let me see, where did I, I think I actually might've kept, who asked about this? Ah, uh, yeah, Shaggymon. Um, he was talking about the graveyard fence. Uh, he asked for techniques to get the rails on the graveyard, uh, iron fence really rusty. Like, so the fencing that surrounds the little mausoleum that Bob Rodolfi sculpted up for, up for us. But I realized that I could make these pillar, central pillar things, um, iron, maybe even the top and just do stone or, or, you know, cement for the, um, the underlying stuff and maybe some bronze, uh, for the little skulls here. So I could do some vertigree. Um, and kind of show you what I would do to create a really rusted effect on these, uh, the body of these columns. I am madman. I'm so happy. I was just telling people that I am actually 99% unpacked in my office now. I'm about 95% in the rest of the house. There's still like, we have like maybe six small boxes, like mostly of books, um, that I just have to put on shelving. But, oh my gosh, like for the past, for the five days before this one, I did nothing but unpack. So it's in only five days I've completely organized and unpacked my house, except for six or seven boxes. So I feel I feel quite accomplished. Also, Miss Anne, I uh, updated the stream schedule. Oh, awesome! Thanks, Justin. So Margaret, it is now updated. And thank you for letting us know that we needed to do that. All right, I'm gonna actually use green stuff for the some of the corrosion effect. So I'm gonna mix up just a little bit of it, and remember that your standard. Standard proportions are around one part blue to two parts yellow. And the yellow tends to be a little bit um, thicker than the blue in the in the ribbon too. So eh, about like that. I actually like a little tiny bit more blue. I don't like really soft green stuff. It gets very sticky if you put a lot of yellow in it, but it does give you more working time. And it does uh, mean that you can do gentler shapes. Um, it does... Uh, it also holds better detail if it's really soft. Um, it doesn't, you don't have to push as much on it to make it hold detail. Yeah, yeah, isn't it nice uh, when you have a new painting area? Like, I'm actually, uh, I've got a much small, well, not really a smaller, I guess I'm just more compressed. Um, I have about as much room as I had in the old house, but I could spread it out more in the old house because it was pretty much my living room was my work room. So my bookshelves were farther away from me, <laughs> but my desk was still the same. Um, but I actually kind of like how cozy this is. And Justin says the sound quality is really good for the stream. So that's being in a small room with uh, more reverb, I assume, um, more surfaces to, uh, around me instead of a big echo chamber, um, 
so yeah so that's nice let me put my green stuff away here let's get this i'm gonna get myself a little bit more situated but yeah so i'm excited since i am now unpacked that was my big press is i wanted to get almost all the way unpacked now i feel like i can do a box a day over the next week just to organize you know more things and i will be good um, but the more, most important thing now is that I could finally get back to my Patreon and get back to my, um, my commissions and get back to, you know, and, and feel comfortable, um, being here with you guys on stream. Remember to mix your green up very well. I usually start with the blue on the outside because it's less sticky. I get very annoyed when green sticks to my fingers. Also remember that green is not non-toxic. So after you utilize it, wash your hands very well and do not lick your gulping tools. Do not do it. If you must use saliva for a lubricant, I usually lick my thumb and like use that. Um, but you do not want to ingest this stuff. It's not good for you. Um, so yeah, be careful when using green. There we go. That's about right. So this is a lighter green color. It's more yellowy green, you can see. Um, yeah, uh, one to two. It's, you know, it's not doing it wrong, McKnight. Um, hey, Edward Drag, it's good to see you. Um, this is what the sculptors recommend is a bit more yellow and the reason is it holds fine detail better it is softer to work with it takes longer to cure so you get more open time with it um and eventually when it starts getting toward the end of cure you can still do some nice rounded shapes with it like for skin and stuff um so it's it's just uh it gives you a bit of a longer working time it's a little bit softer i think that um it's probably more useful overall for more techniques um, to do it this way because of the, when you put more blue in it, it's a little harder. Uh, and so you can't, you know, it's harder to do some techniques. The blue is going to, higher blue content is going to resist your sculpting tool more. It's going to bounce back a little bit more. So it's, uh, this gives you more workability on the green. So it's not that it's bad or wrong. It's just that it's different. Um, and if you find that, you know, you might try it, try doing the two to one yellow to blue and see if you like that consistency a little better. I think that, uh, <laughs> thanks Jedi Jared. Um, yeah, well, knowledge mom, you know, so why not? Um, but yeah, I mean, try it. The one thing that, that this mix does do better, I think is smoothing. Um, so if you need to gap fill and you need to like totally smoothly fill a gap, actually, let's take this frost giant, frost giant. Let's see. What do I have? I was at the back of her hand. So the back of her hand had kind of a mold line. You can kind of see it. And I couldn't get it off with my files and knives. So I knew I was going to have to do green, but obviously on this, I need to smooth it into areas, right? It can't be rough because it's her skin. So I take a tiny little bit of green. So we'll just, we're going off topic, Justin. Sorry. Derailed. No problem. Completely derailed. Um, this is probably even too much, but that's okay. Cause we can squeeze it off. So put your green about where you want it. And I'm going to use water cause I've gotten into the habit of just using water and I'm going to press it down cause I want to fill in. So in your gap filling or smooth, especially when you're smoothing out like shallow mold lines like that, I find that a softer mix, more yellow is great because it's so soft that you can smoosh it almost like completely flat. So when you're trying to blend into another area and then use your, your sculpting tool and put it off to the side. And this is a piece of brass rod, by the way, that's been shaped into a spoon with files, pounded flat with a hammer, probably a ball peen would be the way to go. Um, and then shaped with like, you could use diamond files probably for to shape that. And then I'm going to, stretch it out continue to stretch it out stretch 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 don't worry about the shape of it yet because you've got remember you've got a lot of working time on this like this especially because you're using a higher yellow mix so i'm kind of pressing it flat up here against her knuckles i really like my tiny spoon shape um, another sculpting tool shape you could use that's more in let's just leave that to sit for a second let me see. I dug out, uh, I actually unearthed a bunch of my sculpting tools so I could show you guys alternate shapes that you could use for this that are very easy to find. Um, probably the best one for this otherwise is going to be this shallow spoon, which should be very easy to find. Um, you can see it's, you could use the tip of it to kind of press down because it's kind of got the, the more narrowing toward the tip thing. So you could use that. You could also use like the spade shape which is the, the full, full spade. 
Um, this is really sharp, so maybe not as much as the leaf. Uh, so the, but those are both uh, very useful shapes. I, I use this one for rocks a lot and things when I have to do sharper edges. Um, so those are both good. And then there's the, let's see, I think those are the two most useful I kept like immediately accessible to me here. I do love my tiny spoon though. Um, I do use it an awful lot. So if you have a hammer of some sort, especially a ball peen, um, or something else rounded that you could make this more curvy, uh, and then, you know, you have a piece of brass rod, you might, uh, consider making yourself a tiny spoon. All right. So this is very rough. We're going to smooth it out more. I do not need the green to cover the entire back of the hand. So I'm going to start pressing down onto it and pulling it off. Hey, Capera. Yeah, anything small, right? Even knitting needles, tiny knitting needle needles. Um, so we might need to change. If I do too much green stuff on this one, Justin, we may need to change the title. And we'll do rust tomorrow. Uh -huh. No problem. Yeah. Uh, I just realized, well, because I am going to also use the screen to create uh, textured effects on uh, the columns. So I just got uh, wanted to show you guys how this is useful. So since it is so soft, it is very easy to press lightly, very lightly. Like I'm just enough to kind of like smear it. You're kind of smearing it. But as you smear it, it is possible to stretch the green when it has a high yellow content and blend it in smoothly. I had so much trouble with this when I first started working with green when I was in college and I couldn't ever get it to blend in smoothly, but I was using a mixture that was more blue, like a 50, 50. And that was really hard. If you see little granules of green start to pop up, that means you've probably flooded the area with water. And when you pull off a tiny bit, it's getting isolated by that liquid. So you can just kind of dab it off with your finger. Or if you've got, um, the edge of an old t-shirt or a cloth, a cloth rag or a, um, even a sticky note or a piece of paper towel or Kleenex. Although be careful with paper towel or Kleenex cause they have fibers. So sometimes I'll just like take some paper, paper and wick the water away. Um, it's good enough. All right. So now we're going to get a little bit more water, but we don't want a ton. And now we'll start smoothing. So we'll put down some water. Maybe I need a little bit more. You want to get a fair amount on there so that you can start kind of doing little round motions and continuing to pull down to make sure that you are blending in your green stuff. And getting this smooth is going to be easier as it cures. So often, like we could leave this probably for maybe while we're doing some rust effects here and go back to it. I do want to put the indentations down between the fingers. So, cause remember on your hand, right? You've got the, the bones and the veins. So you have indentations between the knuckles. So you want to kind of pull down and, and she had those earlier. I don't want to make a big, um, divot, but I do want to make a slight depression. All right. So that's decent. We're going to let it cure. So as we let it set up, Hey, Twistoma, good to know. And threads of hate. Uh, and we should, we should make tiny spoons, uh, official. <laughs> That'd be awesome because then I wouldn't have to freak out about losing these. Um, I believe these, I have two tiny spoons and then I have one that, um, Bobby Wong, who's an old miniatures artist. He also made me a tiny spoon once upon a time that goes into a pin vise. I keep those in here, um, for my backup, my emergency backup tiny spoons. Uh, I think these are from Gene's old sculpting kit because Gene used to uh, produce a little sculpting kit to go with his sculpting classes. And so I believe that the two tiny spoons that I have are, uh, are from Gene. So perhaps we need to mass, mass produce the tiny spoon in the future. Okay. I'm going to just smooth that in a little bit more. It is kind of going particulate as you stretch out, as you stretch it out, you got to be careful because you can drag off little tiny beads of it, which are very annoying. If you get a ragged edge, it can be hard to smooth in. So I'm going to let this go. Um, at this point, I've got a nice, you know, surface down. I've disguised the mold line. Um, and if I let it set up for a little bit, it's going to be easier to work with without scarring the surface. And I might move to a bigger, broader tool too, to smooth that. So let's put that aside and let's grab our green stuff. Uh, other things green is good for getting, by the way, anytime you have a concave surface, like this, where I had, um, on the resin here, I had a couple of, uh, 
bits of, of resin, just beads of resin on the inside of these uh, cloak areas, it's almost impossible to dig this out with a knife. So the thing to do is to just fill it in. So you use your green and you fill in just a little bit on the inside of these folds uh, to make them rounder and to cover up those scar the scars. Again, also if you have ever heat pitting or roughness, like in this back fold here, you can uh, use it as well, just a little bit to smooth it out. Anytime you've got a mold line or anything on, on an interior surface, um, like here, this is a good one where this cloth, you know, see how it dips in? That's a concavity and there's a mold line right there. So it's going to be very hard for me to get a file in there without taking out part of this fold, which I don't want to do. So then I should use a little bit of my green when it's fresh and kind of put a skin of green over this area um, to clean it up. So that's many uses of soft green stuff when you are trying to disguise stuff. But now let's use green to make some texture because uh, I want some texture on the bottom of uh, these pillars so that like the rust is really getting rough. Now there is a technique if you have a larger model um, using baking soda for this where you use the baking soda eating tiny cereal. <laughs> tiny Spoon is sculpting. Wet, wet toast is damp. Um, I use it for smoothing down, like if you've got miniatures that are small, it makes sense to use a small sculpting tool. So I have Tiny Spoon and that's what I use it for. Pretty much Tiny Spoon is a huge, like I use it for a lot of sculpting, like a lot, a lot, even though it's tiny. I just like it. I'm comfortable with it. I like that it has a rounded back and that it's got an edge that I can cut with and a spoon, you know, that I can divot with. So it's very useful. And then it's, it's, uh, the other, the rounded rod is it's uh, counterpart. And that's also useful for if you're doing texture, like we're about to be doing. So, okay. So rust, when it gets really heavy, it gets caked, that caked effect, right? So as I was about to say, you can use baking soda for this. There are baking soda tricks, uh, that you could look up on the interwebs. Um, I don't use them because I've heard for one, I like a little bit more control. And for another, um, I, I have seen people say they've had experience with blooms where if they have a high humidity day, the baking, so the white of the baking soda will bloom through the paint. So your mileage may vary. That may be a thing. So if you use baking soda for this, keep that in mind. Um, if you use green, you have to wait for it to cure, but then, you know, you've got very, very much more control, I think. Um, do, 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 do. soft silicone shapers. Yeah, I've got, I've got, um, or clock. That would be a good thing to post on our discord. Um, for that, I do have a lot of clay shapers at the moment. They're kind of stored away because I was not doing sculpting up to this point. Um, but yeah, you could use the silicone clay shapers, uh, for this sort of thing. I do find that if I want a sharper texture that I cannot, they're not as effective because they're good for soft, rounded, smoothing effects. So I've gotten, uh, it's all what you get used to, right? So I've gotten very used to Tiny Spoon, but you should always experiment. Just like with palettes and brushes, you should always experiment with a bunch of different um, items, right? Tools. And to see what works for you. Because what works for you may not be the same as what works for someone else. So, all right. So rust is kind of a rough, stipply texture. And rust is going to be, rust and corrosion are generally going to be where stuff is pooling, right? Where moisture is pooling. So if I was going to put some texture up here, I'd put it right around this crack and I'd have to be careful with it. Probably only put a little bit up there. But mostly moisture is going to run down this column. It's going to pool at the bottom. Uh, so your rust texture is going to be down here in general. You kind of want to rip this up. At this point, you do actually want a ripped up green stuff um, because rust is very randomized in the way it spreads. And so you want to have it in various shapes and places. And so you can mush it down and do all sorts of stuff. Um, doo -doo -doo. Oh, okay. You guys are helping Fox. All right. Yeah. Fox can, yeah, it's a little weird on the phone with the, with the prime. That's for sure. All right. I am very glad that you think this is cool. Afro queen. All right. So our point here is to use whatever sculpting tool we're using to push and kind of make a stippling texture. So do, 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 do. And obviously you can see the moisture on here. So I put a little bit of water down so that I could, uh, not have my tool stick to the green. And definitely make, if you make some deeper holes with more buildup around them, that's going to suggest um, 
a more caked on rust and so we'll be painting those areas a different color um, and you want to make them probably a little bit shallow and you want to kind of stipple you still want this stippled texture because you know rust has that cakey uneven texture so that's what you're aiming for you don't have to nail it perfectly because you're going to be able to um, you know to affect some of the ways it looks with paint right so so definitely have some fun see this one is we did a slightly different uh, direction with this one. We went a little up. That's great. And so we're just making it really rough there. Let me see. Let me get in focus here. Let me get my palette out of the way. And let me get really in focus so you guys can see this. One sec. Let me get my camera. There we go. It's a little better. So now we've, we're a bit more in focus. You can see the rough texture I'm doing here. I need more, uh, definitely need more. Yeah, Achilles Blade. Uh, Justin needs to change the the, the um, name of the stream. I thought we were going to do um, rust. We are actually sculpting a uh, rust texture at this point to be painted over, probably in tomorrow's stream. Um, but I wanted to actually do some texture for rust because a lot of people use baking soda. You can also use pigments like um, the powdered uh, pastel pigments that uh, like Secret Weapon produces and some of the other like uh, historical gaming people do. Um, that, see, I got a little stick on that, so I'll make sure to clean my green stuff off my sculpting tool and use more water. Um, but yeah, you can use pigments caked up with like a solvent. I really don't like solvents. I don't like, bre I don't like breathing them in. I don't like, you know, spilling them and having everything smell like lighter fluid. I, I generally have bad luck with solvents. So for Anne, you will often, even when solvents are a great solution for a lot of this weathering stuff, you will often see me not use them simply because they annoy me. Um, in many different ways. Also, they are not non-toxic, obviously. All right, so I'm pulling out some little scaly effects here. We've got some nice irregular patches um, that we can turn into uh, rust effects now, which is great. I kind of want to pull some out onto the base, though, too. Um, just a little. Well, uh, actually, the bloom is probably going to be good. If I make this stone or concrete, then I need to limit my rust cakiness. Although the still going to get a bunch at the bottom here, so I don't feel bad about that. All right, there we go. So yeah, and essentially you could just paint on rust effects and we'll cover that tomorrow too. But if you want it to have three dimensional, like if you want really caked on, then you want to probably use some green or some, some pigments or some baking soda, baking, um, baking soda mixed with the paint or whatever to make it thick and cakey. Uh, do not add vinegar to your baking soda or you will have a volcano on your miniature. It will not be pretty. You will have to wash it greatly afterwards. All right, so let's do this. Let's smoosh it to the side and get a little bit up. Got a little tendril there. That's nice. So yeah, just this is very easy texture because you just need it to be kind of randomized, right? It rush, rust itself just follows patterns of fluid and uh, blooms out in various directions based on its uh, the mineral structure of the iron. So we will continue doing this there. And verdigris cakes also. So if I do these little skulls, if I do this inset like a bronze plate, um, technically you would, you could put some cakey texture back here um, or, or down more likely down here but these are so deep. These holes are so deep. I don't know that you'd be able to see it anyway. Um, I guess what it would do if we did fill in these holes is we could put like a darker verdigree or a lighter verdigree to show that it's more cakey there. Right now, if we put verdigree in between these, it's going to get lost down there. So probably we do want to do that uh, if I want to do a verdigree, verdigree bronze effect, which I kind of do. So let's just take a little bit and I'll show you how to get... Let's, let's use the more standard sculpting tool that you guys can find. Let's see here. We'll use our spade and our little routed spoon thing. All right, and we want tiny little bits of uh, green, so we're probably going to kind of pull it out and cut off little bits. And my green is still really pliable, so you can see that it's, you know, it does last for a long time when you use a higher yellow content. It's not really setting up. Remember that we have to do the back of that hand, too, so I want to be careful. More terrain options. Well, we're moving. Uh, we're moving that direction as fast as we can, freestyle, because uh, you'll notice in the last two kickstarters we really are are moving toward terrain. Um, the big thing about terrain. Oh, I forgot to do my rust up there by the crack. Let's do that first. I don't want to forget it. Um, the big thing about terrain is just you know how how it, the the problem is you have to make it cheap enough for people 
to go in on it. Because the problem with terrain is that a lot of people got used to making their own. And so if you're going to make your own, the only thing that's going to convince you to buy somebody's pre-made terrain is if it's affordable. And that's a problem with a lot of modern terrain options and why they don't work very well or why terrain companies often have problems is that uh, if they'll do a really nice piece of terrain, but then they have to price it higher. And so people might buy it because it's really nice, but they won't sell as many as they would have if they could have done a more affordable piece. And so I often see terrain companies just kind of forever be tiny companies. They can't really grow or, or do as many projects as they would like because, you know, Kickstarter has changed that a little bit, I think. There's been a couple of terrain Kickstarters, but um, it's an odd kind of thing. The other th problem with terrain is that it's very specific, right? You can do cer certain, like, things. Um, like, the dragons don't share uh, terrain, which, uh, you know, you can you could buy separately at the Kickstarter with the dragon. I don't remember if you still can. Um, but that's nice, because that's kind of a ruined round castle or uh, tower base. Got a little extra on there. Um and so, you know, you could, you could adapt that to almost any, uh, adventure, adventure. So, and of course, if you're doing wargaming terrain, you know, then it doesn't matter so much. You, you do usually want a few specific things. All right. So I essentially am suggesting there's a lot of fluid is caught in, uh, this crack here and that there is a bloom on either side of it. I'm going to grab some of this and put it down below. Let's see here. Yeah, Dwarven Forge. Yeah, Dwarven Forge is the exception. Um, and you know, <sighs> Dwarven Forge is an oddity. Like it's gr it's great. It looks great if you paint it up, but I know so many people that just ended up liquidating their Dwarven Forge or foisting it off on friends because they ended up not using it. You know, I guess if Dwarven Forge makes its money, then it doesn't matter if people actually use the product. But we, um, it's, it's just weird, right? You, sometimes it's applicable and it's only applicable if you're doing this or that or the other thing. And so I'm just saying terrain is a weird, a weird thing for a miniature company to go into because you have to kind of be careful. You don't want to do so much of it and then, you know, kind of not make a lot of money off of it and end up putting resources there that you could have put somewhere else, right? You could have done a new dragon or another, you know, five figures for that terrain. But yeah, I mean, Dwarven Forge has made terrain their business for so many years now. What, like at least 25 years, right? So they definitely know that their product is in demand and that people want uh, nice dungeons to run their campaigns in. So they're, they're the exception, I think, that they've really made it work. All right, so a little bit of texture around that crack up there. And in fact, since we built up the texture on the edge of the crack, it actually makes the crack appear bigger. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah, you know, Threads of Fate, it's like, yeah, storage, transportation, all that stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, the Dwarven Forge stuff, when you put it together, when you paint it and put it on the table, it looks amazing. Like, no, no question um, that it looks great. Like, I liked playing with it when we first got our, uh, our shipment. But then, yeah, then it was just hard to, like, you have to pre-plan. It's the same thing with all the dungeons, dungeon set terrain. Is you've got to, as a GM, you have to be pre-planning a bit. All right, so I'm using this. I'm going to fill in some of these deep cracks toward the bottom where the moisture will pool. I want to be able to suggest um, more caked on verdigris down here. So I'm just taking little bits and kind of putting them where I want them. Um, I could also, instead of using the reverse spoon, the other tiny spoon, this is your other tiny spoon. Um, it's on the other side of this uh, spade tool. So that's that's another good, if you need to round surfaces, this is a good one. Yeah, yeah, it does, it's not, yeah, and, and it is expensive. I mean, it's less expensive if you, uh, you know, got in on the Kickstarter, right? But, all right, so now I'm going to take the tip of my spade tool to punch this stuff down into some of these cracks and create a bit of texture. Yeah, originally I was like, well, I can kind of show you guys how to do some green stuff, uh, iron texture, and then we can paint, and then we'll go back to it tomorrow. But I'm like, well, I've got fresh green stuff. This is the horrible thing about fresh green stuff, right? It makes you, you're like, oh, dang, I've got fresh green stuff, and I didn't use it all. I should use it all. So you grab every project that you have uh, nearby that might need green stuff so you don't waste it. Which is silly because it's relatively inexpensive and a little goes a long way. But it, yet that is our human uh, way of thinking, right? 
Um, I will admit that I am totally that way. I will save up projects that need green added um, and kind of make a little pile of them. And then I will mix up green stuff and I will just hit everything um, so that I, I utilize it. I do have a putty catcher also. Oh, putty catchers, for those who don't know, is a fact uh, uh, that, okay, so you get you make a putty catcher because you always have extra green stuff. It never fails. And if you don't have extra green stuff, you don't have enough, and then you have to mix up more, and then you have extra green stuff. So I'm making a little rock base um, on one of Reaper's longer cavalry bases. This is uh, the 74065 um, long oval. I figured I would make a creature standing on the rocks once I get the rocks fully done. Um, but I, this is my putty catcher. So I'm just using it every time I have extra green stuff to build up more rocks. And this is how I started. So I'm going to fill up this side now and plump out that bottom of that rock. Um, and maybe widen it a little bit, but yeah, so I thought I would make a critter standing on the rocks eventually, which would be my first like time trying to sculpt a, a critter. So, but yeah, so definitely grab a base or something and, uh, make a putty catcher for yourself. And that also lets you practice, uh, with extra green. So it has two functions. It gets you more uh, acclimated to green. Yeah, in fact, um, some of Reaper's miniatures started as putty catchers. Jason Weeby was pretty famous for that before he switched to ZBrush. Um, some of the huge things that he sculpted, like the huge tree man uh, that ended up in Bones Kickstarter, I believe was originally a putty catcher. Because um, Jason will just start some huge epic project, you know, with all of his green that all of his green would go on. And... Uh, it would just be this huge thing and he would have no idea if anybody would ever, you know, want to produce it. But then when Reaper started the Bones Kickstarters, suddenly we were able to produce those giant things. The Grudge Bust, I believe, also started life as a putty catcher. All right, so just pretty much poking in some green into these lower areas so that I can suggest build up. I might put a little touch of one up there too. I like to kind of spread it out. I like it, if I'm going to do this... I kind of don't want to put it all at the bottom. I want to find some of these uh, deeper fissures up here so that if I'm going to make this uh, verdigris a different color because it's more caked up, um, then I have that color several places. It's not just all in a line at the bottom. Uh, so, And you notice I'm just like putting my extra snake of green over here so that I have it handy and I can work with it. I'm not keeping it over on the side of something else. That way I can work kind of organically. Yeah, I, I agree, Khalees Blade. I actually enjoy... Um, working on terrain. It's actually one of my little secret happy places um, to paint really nice terrain. I have several pieces actually that I finally took out and let out into the light of day here in California um, because I actually want to put paint on them finally. So, And then I can put minis on them just for fun. Uh, as far as green stuff, uh, said we, yeah, for the most part. Uh, however, uh, one caveat, sometimes green, uh, green definitely goes bad. Like it, it gets old. Um, if it's in a ribbon, then what will happen is it will cure where the green and yellow are touching down the middle. So that's why when you see me pluck green stuff off, you'll see me do it kind of, uh, off either end. So that's not showing up very well. You can kind of see there. Yeah. So I kind of avoid the middle part. I essentially keep plucking down the sides and then I just rip that off and trash it. Uh, because all of this is going to have lumps in it because the green and blue are, are cured. The fresher the green stuff, the less lumpy, but you still, you lose that center strip. Um, if you have the tubes, then that's not as much of a, of a thing. But in either case, if you want your green stuff to say, stay fresh and super pliable, you want to put it in the freezer and store it in cold temperatures. Um, which I don't remember if I currently, I think I did throw some of my green in the freezer. Um... So when you buy it, the moral of the story is when you buy it from particular, uh, some outlets um, may not have as it as fresh. At Reaper, I'm pretty sure that you're guaranteed pretty fresh green because uh, we go through it fast. And so since we have such a high turnover, since we don't order it in huge, huge batches, um, the green we do have tends to be quite fresh. So ordering it from various other places... Uh, I have not, Madman. I looked at liquid green stuff and went, why? <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, you can use it to, to fill gaps, but, and you know, it's kind of paste, but it's also kind of hard to work with. So for me, green at least stays where I put it and doesn't have a goopy texture. And so I can smooth it down effectively. Um, liquid green stuff, I've just, I've just, uh, heard that it's just super hard to use. 
Uh, it was. It sounded like a good idea in theory, but I think it was not <laughs> actually a good idea. All right, so I'm, that's where I'm going to do all my little greens there on the faces. So I'm going to have some caked up texture there. I've got my texture up there. Um, if I want to do some on the back side, now is the time. But I also need to keep in mind that my green is curing. And this is the nice thing about working on several projects at once is that as you are working, you can kind of sense as you work whether your green is starting to firm up a little bit, right? Um, so I think it might be okay to work on this hand now. We're going to try it. And I'll actually use, um, well, I don't, don't particularly want to use that. I'm going to go back to tiny spoon because it's where my comfort zone is. And I'm going to put a lot of water on the top. So I want to beat it, beat up some water on there so that I can start polishing. And the less, the more cured your green is, and since I spread it out so thin on this surface, it's probably curing a little faster than my big ball of green. Um, I hope. Uh, starting to skin over. Once your green starts to skin over a bit, you can polish it a lot better. Now you can also use Vaseline um, as a uh, sculpting medium to uh, keep your, sculpt your tool from sticking to the green. And you can get some very nice smooth effects by using Vaseline, but then you must um, wash the model afterwards since obviously primer and paint are not going to adhere to petroleum jelly. So that's the downside, right? Let's see here. Ah, uh, yeah. Oh, I didn't know it shrinks. Good, good, uh, good tip wavy. Thank you. Yeah. I could imagine actually that it might be now that you've mentioned that wavy, I bet it would be good for stuff like rust, right? You can just put a little blob down and just kind of like smoosh it around until it looks kind of corrosive. Um, that might work really well. Do, 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 do. So I'm pretty much just kind of uh, massaging the green to make it smoother and smoother. I want it to fit in. I don't want any tool marks in her hand at all. Uh oh, my dog is restless. This is a bad sign. Okay, she's gonna settle down again. Good. I didn't want a Curie emergency to disrupt today's uh, stream. Pretty sure I'll need to take her out right after stream though. And I'm going to take this time to kind of make sure the edges up here are smoothed in. It's just a very gentle texture. Like, it's almost like the weight of my fingers alone. Like, maybe a tiny bit more press um, onto the screen to try to get it smooth, smooth, smooth. And I kind of tilt it. I'll kind of tilt it into the light to see how it looks. You won't know until, it's, until you prime it if it's really, really smooth. But you can at least kind of take a look at it in the light. Kind of tilt it various angles, look for irregularities in the surface and where you see them, try to fix them while you still have working time. I'm pretty happy with this. I think it turned out pretty smooth. So we fixed that mold line. You can also use, you don't want to put fingerprints in it, but you can use the, the tip of your finger to burnish as well. Once the green is set up and you're not going to push it appreciably, you can put a bunch of water on it and kind of just smooth over it. You want to start off the surface and smooth across it. Don't want to leave fingerprints, but your finger is a nice big round soft thing. So it is sometimes nice to get a nice uh, smooth surface. Um, essentially, uh, orc luck. I got it. Um, if you watch the start of the stream, I essentially there. Oh yeah. It's nice and smooth now. Like you can see how smooth that, that became excellent. All right. I'm pretty happy with that actually. Um, when you, uh, the key is to start with it very sticky. So you want uh, a high percentage of, uh, yellow, versus blue. So you want two to one yellow versus blue. That's going to make it really sticky. So you don't want to put any fluid. You want to make sure you've washed your figure before you do this, um, to take any mold release off the surface, 
put a blob of green down and then just start patting and stretching it. But you need to use, remember to use something on your sculpting tool so you're not ripping it up. If your green is ripping up, you probably need more fluid or, or whatever you're using on your sculpting tool. Um, because, uh, the ripping up thing is usually just uh, a response to, you know, your sculpting tools pressure. And if it's responding to your pressure, uh, and sticking to the tool and ripping, then, then you probably uh, have not enough uh, fluid or lubricant. But, uh, then once it's firmly starting to set up, you're good. Um, I did, let me see if I can get it to tear to kind of like talk about what you're talking about. So it's starting to set up a little bit, so I don't know if I'll be able to get it as uh, as thin or cluck. Let's see. And then I'll get to those other questions. So, okay, so if I put this down and I wanted to smooth it in, I would start by, pull, by lubricating. So I put some water on my tool. I'd start spreading it out with gentle pressure. And I'd probably would rip it. I'd start... I, I need more, more water, but see, as you can see, I'm going to rip it off, right? So that's what you're talking about. So there is a point where I, you pull it too far and it will rip. So you also want to work it gently. So if I just want this to not rip, my point is to continue working it with slow, even pressure, and then I can get it to elongate without ripping. And if you've got a thick part here in the middle, you just have to work slow, push gently. If you push too far, it's going to rip. Too far too fast, I should say. So you kind of have to keep an eye on it. But you can continue to stretch it with small movements. I'm going to take some of that off. But it's small movements here are key. Small movements. You can stretch it actually really far with a lot of water and patience. Oh, see. Then I, I took it too far and it ripped. This is also starting to set up so it's a little bit stiffer. If, you, if you're going to do this sort of thin skinning, do it right after you mix up your green stuff and make sure you're using more yellow than blue. Now, can I fix what I just did? Yes, I can, probably. If I smush these two together, I can fix that rip. And again, I'm just going to keep going until I can blend it in to the surface. There. All right. Hold on here. Uh, said we, uh, my favorite, least favorite part is preparing prepping. Yeah, I know. I hate it too. Um, how long do you spend preparing a miniature for competition or commission? Depends on the model, right? Um, like for, for this resin frost giant queen, she's actually really pristine. I just had to get her hand, um, fixed so that, cause she had a mold line on the back of that. I'm going to have to take some green and fill in these guys and, uh, also, um, fill in that right there. Uh, I might fill in that fold a little bit cause it's rough and I can't get to it easily. And I've got a resin divot back here. So for this amount of green work, but also she didn't have, she had almost no mold lines. So I would say easily one to two hours of prep to get a model to competition level. Um, usually these days I'm working on like resin busts, which are usually resin is pretty high quality casting usually. So, oh, and there's another, another mold line. I'll have to fix that. Um, I would say one to two hours is pretty standard. Uh, if it's a smaller metal piece without a lot of mold lines, I could get away with a half an hour if it doesn't take any green work. Um, but I also, the other thing I do at the same time as I'm doing mold lines and prep work and green work usually is I build a base for it. Um, so that also takes up time. Like if I'm going to do extra texturing or put her up on, uh, on something, this resin copy didn't come with a base that came with the bones model. So I'm going to actually create a base for this model and I'll probably do it on stream later this week. We'll probably, that was something that people asked for a while ago was, uh, show me how to make a bigger base, a ba base for a bigger model. Um, and I think I'll, I'll do that for Miss Frost Giant cause I want to, uh, and I can show you guys some cool techniques that I used to use. I haven't used in a long time. I want to get back to it. I, I uncovered all my basing stuff um, when I moved and all my cool basing stuff. So I'm like, oh, I could use this now that I finally know where it is and it's easy to hand. So yeah, so as far as the skinning the green thing, um, how do you fill gaps for a model that was painted in pieces? Um, honestly, same thing, um, Hydromane. I, I have no problems with painting over green stuff or putting green stuff over paint. So... For me, it's just mix up a tiny bit of fresh green stuff. You still want it more yellow than blue because obviously you're going to want it to fill gaps. So you're going to want it to be pretty mushy. Uh, and you're going to want to be able to blend it in. 
So the, the small amount of texture that I'm using to blend this green into this underlying bone surface is not enough to scar a paint job. And that's why you want to use something kind of flat and rounded if you can to do this, um, or even your finger if you can, if you put enough, enough water on it. Um, because with just gentle pressure, you are not going to rip up your paint job. What you're going to do, is, you are going to damage your paint job if you use the edge of anything. So you want to use probably a clay shaper, I would say, or something rounded like Tiny Spoon here. Um, I'll get out my clay shapers next time we talk about green and we can play with those. Um, but, uh, but yeah, and then I just paint over it. I don't even prime over green. Once green is cured, I paint over it. The exception will be if, um, if I'm working it on a surface that's going to get a lot of contact, like somewhere where somebody's going to pick up the model a lot, um, then, or that, or handle the model during gaming, for example, then I probably would prime it. But usually when you're filling gaps, that's not the case, right? Usually when you're filling gaps, you, uh, you're not uh, worrying about um, handling because it's down in a gap. So I'm actually just going to reintroduce. Okay. So the stone texture, if you did this, like say you filled up a mold line, you wanted to duplicate it. So if you look at this stone texture, it's little divots and it's irregular. So you could actually use a piece of rock and kind of do that, or even a little bit of sponge maybe, but this might be too hard. But generally, if you just take any small tool and you make a little bit of random noise or chatter on the surface, Make sure to also hit the edges of the area. You're not going to rip up that green at this point. It's very firmly attached. Um, and you can just kind of give yourself some little texture there and disguise the fact that you did green at all. That's probably good enough. It's got a little, little bit of, of detail. All it needs to be is close. And then you can paint it just like everything else. Yeah, maybe... Um, I'm probably going to paint the Frost Giant uh, staff and hand, although it fits pretty well with her, so I may not need to do any green to fill, but if I do, then I'll maybe do it on camera. I'll remember that that's kind of a question. I'm going to just tamp down the edge of this green stuff. It got a little ragged. Don't want to tamp it, like, really regularly. I leave a little, pressing a little bit to leave a little texture also, because stone. There. There we go. Got our green, got our stuff. Let's see, what else can I do on this sucker? Um, let's see here. Yeah, yeah, it's a, exactly Orgluxy. And that is why clay shapers, like the fact that it's softer, so you have to press harder. That's how clay shapers can sometimes be a little harder to use on some things. So maybe when you're smoothing, you want to use more of a tool like this where you can control, control the pressure. Let's do that. Let's try using uh, using this spade tool and see if I can control the pressure. So let's say we have a mark there and we don't want it. Oh, I don't want to don't want to impact my green stuff. That's a problem when you start putting green stuff all around something. Is you can uh, finger fingerprint your previous green stuff. So we'll be careful. So all right. So yeah. So maybe a harder tool. Get some metal ones and just start slowly stretching. And let's say I don't want to go all the way with this. So let's actually take a bunch off. So you see that was to, in order to get that to shred like I wanted it to, I had to press and pull and I had to do it sharply. But now I can blend that edge in with gentle pressure. And yeah, the green at this point is starting to really cure and get stiff. And so now it would be very hard or impossible to use a clay shaper on this um, to get it smooth. Like you really need to be able to put a little bit more pressure on it to try to blend it in. But again, because it's starting to set up, it's also not ideal to try to blend this into a surface. Um, you really want to use fresh green for that. I got a little bit of green on my sculpting. If you get a little green on your sculpting tool and it cures on there, don't worry. You can actually just take a knife and kind of use it against the, the tool like this, and you can take it right off, just like you do with um, pokey tools if you want to clean up your pokey tool. So don't worry about that. All right, but yeah, so this is starting to really set up, and I'm having a lot of trouble making it thin enough to blend into this under area. I probably will not be able to blend it in smoothly. I'm going to have a ragged edge there. See that upper edge? I'm going to have that ragged edge no matter what I do because my green is now too firm, too much cured, 
to get a smooth blend into that surface. So there is an illustrative uh, example of how if you want to blend your green in when you're gap filling, definitely do it at the start of the green, right, a green process. Do it right after you mix the green. Um, if you need to do sculpted textures, you can wait until the green is stiffer, no problem. Um, if you're trying to do things like rocks or lumps and you don't have much of an armature, then definitely wait till it's set up a lot. Um, so it's all like the depth of detail that you want to get in. But even with my big tool trying to blend this in, I don't think I'm going to be able to because it's just too set up. So, so instead I will texture the edges and make it look intentional. Ha ha. Just put some scarring and stuff on that surface. Make it rough. You can always take it off at this point. Also, I could skin it off, just scrape it off if I didn't like it, but it's pretty flat. So I think I can just like create some stone texture and blend it in a little. Maybe I'll make it some moss. We'll put some uh, some moss or stuff growing up onto the uh, bottom of the pillar. That could work. Then we could disguise this ugly green work. Yeah, so good example of how you do not want to work late with your green when you're trying to smooth. Okay, next stuff. Um... Let's see here. I've got to catch up with you guys. Jason Zavoda, what tool? Which I'm not sure which tool you were referring to. So this is a wax. I think it's a it's either a dental or a wax sculpting tool with a spade on one side and a small spade spoon on the other. Um, my tool here was made by Gene Van Horn, who is a sculptor. It came in an old sculpting uh, kit of his. Uh, I call it Tiny Spoon because it's Tiny Spoon. Um, I love Tiny Spoon as my primary primary sculpting tool. Um, it is essentially a brass rod that's simply been hammered flat and then shaped with diamond files into a spoon. So it is super easy for anybody to make. Um, I'm not sure of the actual thickness of the brass rod. I'm going to guess about a millimeter-ish. Um, but yeah, so these are really, brass sculpting tools are pretty easy to make yourself. Probably could find some articles online about that. Pretty darn sure. Let's see here. All right, let's see here. Do I use the rubber? Yeah, the clay shapers. Um, <laughs> that's that would be uh i have a bunch of clay shapers althai um a, a bunch a bunch a bunch like crappy like like oh like uh, three packages maybe three and a half packages of them but i um i don't like them for some things because i find that they uh, they're not effective once your green starts to get like really set up unless you're doing really subtle texture um i know some people use them for everything and i really feel like at that point, it's just the sculpting tool you got used to and really comfortable with is the one you tend to grab. I started with hard sculpting tools and got very used to them and pretty much like, you know, learned how to sculpt with those. Uh, so now clay shapers, when I try to use them, I'm not sure quite how to use them. I would have to like get used to it. I would imagine they'd be actually really good for larger sculpts where I'm trying to get a smooth surface on like a face, for example. Um, if I'm trying to like uh, do big, big rounded areas like that, I think they would be actually really useful for that, but I haven't quite gotten into them. So I am somewhat handicapped in my, uh, my sculpting tool preference because of that. I know very, I know how to use a hard tool extremely well and I don't, I'm not real familiar with, what, with the clay shapers. So, but I do own a bunch, so I can totally. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I did answer your question before, but now in more detail. Uh, Milliput. Wavy, I never got into Milliput. When I started using Milliput, I really just didn't like the texture of it. And so I instead learned how to do the green. Um, I think also it, it probably was because I was surrounded by sculptors, right? I, I've been at Reaper for uh, over 17 years now. And uh, the sculptors, I met them very early. And so I learned a lot about how to work with green um, rather than Milliput. And the community I grew up in was very much a games workshop um, or RPG hobby. And a lot of those guys didn't even know Milliput existed. Uh, what they learned about was green stuff. So I think it was just what I was exposed to when I was first uh, starting to gap fill. Um, and out of all of the putties and things that I tried at that point, uh, the one that was easiest to get uh, to work was green stuff. Uh... <laughs> Yay, said we. I'm glad everybody is asking what you're thinking. That's great. This is a good educational stream. Um, yeah, crazy. Well, big projects with green can be very intimidating, Nomad Zeke. 
I mean, it's, uh, I'm good at gap filling and mild and small amounts of texture and I can sculpt, you know, little simple things, but like I tried to sculpt a hand recently for, um, for a conversion on a bust I was doing and I had to actually go back and use, um, Fimo instead. Like I tried to use a green and Fimo mix to do it and I just, I gave up. I could not, um, make it work. So so for me, and that probably also comes from the fact that I'm a, I was trained as a 2D artist. I went to art school at UW-Madison, and uh, so I learned clay, right? And of course, as a kid, I was using clay. I wasn't using like green or epoxy putties. So when it comes to trying to do bigger conversions and forms that are compl complex like a hand, which is one of the most, um, probably the hardest thing other than a face to sculpt and get right, um, I felt that I just, I, I had big problems with it when I did it with green. When I went back and did it with Fimo, nailed it first time. Um, so, or at least to the point. Now, the thing is that I have the basic shape of the hand, but what I found that I wanted to do was to then take green and go back onto that Fimo hand and add details. Um, and that, that seems to work for me very well. And for those who didn't know, you can mix green stuff with Fimo and Sculpey. And if you do it like around a half and half, um, the green will cure the Fimo and Sculpey because the green's curing reaction is heat based. So you don't, you can't go too much Fimo and Sculpey. I'm trying to remember the, the exact, I think you can do 50-50 and I think you can't minimize green stuff beyond that or you won't get a cure. Don't quote me on that. You may want to play around. Um, but Bob and Julie do that or, um, a lot on like their bigger stuff. They'll use um, um, Fimo. Jason Weeby also used Fimo green uh, mixes, things like that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, green stuff is, you could try a, uh, an epoxy clay or an epoxy putty plus, um, plus oven clay recipe. Uh, play around Orc Lock. If you're trying to do your own sculpts, play with the green, then try a, a green and, and Fimo or green and Super Sculpey mix. See how it works. See if you like it. Uh, every time you mix something with a green, you're going to change the qualities of it. If you mix a little bit of Fimo with it, it's going to act more like clay and less like green stuff. It gets a lot less sticky. So keep that in mind. That's why when I wanted to go back and add details to the hand I sculpted, uh, like fingernails, green was what I would grab because then I could make it stick to that surface. Yeah, yeah. I like it. I like doing that. If I if I sculpt, I, my goal, my personal goal is to sculpt a bust. I want to sculpt my own bust. So for that, I'm definitely going to oven bake clay. I might go to the mixture um, of oven bake, bake clay and green. That way I don't have to actually bake it. <laughs> You used Milliput as a kid. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. I could see that way because, yeah, like, um, the the audience, like, at one of the game stores that I later hung out with was uh, guys who uh, worked on a lot of model airplanes, model cars, um, and bigger figures uh, and historical stuff. And they definitely had all started with Milliput. So I think it's the different hobbies just start you on a different road. It's like skill trees and video games, you know, right? The culture you're coming from dictates your starting technology. And then you have to put the resources into learning more. So let's just like say that life is a video game and be done with it. Here in, here in COVID land, it is kind of, right? <laughs> We're all digitally relating right now. Um... Oh, uh, Zeistus, it is, uh, actually it's the ratio that the sculptors recommended to me, the Reaper sculptors did, uh, which is two parts yellow to one part green. So it is much lighter, but the uh, advantage is that it's workable for a very long time. Like, if this is still soft and I could still like build rocks on it, build rocks on my putty catcher with it. In fact, I should, so I don't waste it. Um, this is a pretty good consistency. You can see how it smushes. I have to smush it pretty hard to get it to smush. Um, so it's still workable and it has been one hour roughly since I mixed this, maybe a little bit less. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that gives you an idea. Like if I had mixed this with more blue, it would have started to set up a lot earlier. It would have gotten much, uh, stiffer earlier. Um, and it wouldn't have been as good to use for smoothing into surfaces like I did on, on Ms. of Frost Giant's hand, the back of her hand, getting it nice. And now you can see how, how shiny that is. See, nice and smooth. And I can see that I did keep a little bit of the, the divots around between the fingers that I wanted. They might be a little bit too strong. I might need to soften those out. So we'll try. First, we're going to make a rock because I need to need to continue to make rocks for my base. So we'll, we'll start with a rock at the bottom. Actually, I'm going to use my big spade because big spades make faster rocks. You don't have to uh, worry about like what your green stuff looks like. I'll probably work with this folder over I've got mostly for sedimentary rocks or for um, 
rocks that are going to be in layers, you just need to smoosh. So let's see here. And you want kind of random tool. If you do just random tool marks, then you can uh, come back and smooth those in a little bit or use them to create ideas of shapes. I really love sculpting rocks. Um, I love rocks in general. I probably could have uh, gone into geology if I had thought about it more. So we'll make kind of a divot back here where the rock broke. And it helps if you look at a lot of rocks so that you know what they look like. Kind of making a flat surface up top here. I kind of like this, uh, kind of like this, this crack I've got going. So I'm going to grab my tool and accentuate that crack. Oh, that's a little bit wide at that, that part of the sculpting tool. I need Tiny Spoon. Tiny Spoon, come to me. Tiny Spoon is really good. The edge of Tiny Spoon is really good for this. Because it's very sharp. So I can make um, cracks pretty well. And then come in and kind of refine them. There, we've got a nice crack down the middle of our rock. We'll carry it over to the other side. Little details are what makes little rocks. I like sculpting rocks for bases just to make them a little bit more interesting. And often you want to put, maybe you want to put a creature up on a rock. So if you don't want to use cork and it's a small figure, you can do green. Stone is fun to figure out. I really like, yeah, milliput can be sanded. The other um, putty that I used to use a lot of, but don't use as much now, um, is Aves Epoxy Sculpt. And Aves is a lot like Milliput um, in that it can be sanded when it sets. It is really rock hard when it sets. And it also uh, thins with water. So if you add water to Aves, it will become a slurry that you can kind of use to fill gaps too. So for a while there, I really liked Aves. But since I came back to green and realized that I was better at working with it than I thought, I'd gained a bit of skill in it, I, um, I enjoy working with it now. I used to hate it. I used to hate green stuff. I used to be like, who the heck would do anything with green stuff? Except for those crazy sculptors who somehow like make miracles happen with it. That was kind of my thought process. And if I want to dev it in a bit more here, make more layers, kind of flatten that out. Just kind of making a rock. Making rocks is actually, rocks are some of the earliest things I started sculpting, and rocks are actually very useful to learn green stuff. Because you're working with it usually throughout the greens curing process, you know, you're kind of playing around. You're or often using it when the green is stiffer, so it kind of helps you understand what you can get away with with stiffer green and what you can't get away with. And we've got that, and yeah, that's that's a passable rock now. Gonna make this a little bit so that's standing up a little bit. There we go, rock, 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 rock. So yeah, made it, made another little rock for my my base here. I need to do something in here. I'll get in there at some point. Maybe I'll just make this more lumpy out here and make it land on that. Um, but yeah, so there, we added a piece of putty to my putty catcher. Huzzah! All right, let's go back and uh, see if I can fix. I've got a little bit of a strong divot there. I kind of want to make it a little bit softer. So now this green is really set up. So with very gentle pressure, I can smooth out still any strong divots that I don't want. Uh, in fact, it's easier to do gentle rounded areas now that the green is set up because it's not going to be as responsive to pressure, which means you can do more gentle. And now, actually, if I was, if I knew where they were, now is when I would reach for clay shapers, the really firm ones, because I could press pretty hard with those, but not really move the green, but get some nice rounded shapes. Um, but I, I need to figure out where I stuffed them. That's actually one of the few things that I think I chucked into a drawer over here on my left. And uh, I was like, I won't need these. Not right away, because <laughs> I didn't think I was going to be doing green stuff work. Goes to show, right? So I need to grab uh, one pack of them and keep them close at hand. But yeah, so let's see. And I'm going to 
take my hand and just kind of brush over the top and kind of look at it. Yeah, that's good. I've got some nice um, divots like right behind the knuckles and then they kind of blend in. So what I'll be able to do then is accentuate that with paint. So there, now you guys can see, see those divots. Yeah. So that's what I wanted. I have a nice smooth piece of green with no tool marks that I can see, maybe some tiny tool marks down there so I can smooth them out. But yeah, now is the time to really burnish and make that surface shiny so that it's as smooth as the plastic because your green is not gonna pick up minute uh, tools, tool marks at this stage. It's gonna, or at least it's gonna be harder. To scar this green, you'd have to take an edge on and, and, uh, and hit it, which you know hopefully you don't wanna do. There. Yay. Oh, I have a piece of pet hair. Need to get that off of there. <laughs> Curious shedding from the floor up. There we go. Cool, Orcluck. Thanks for posting up stuff on the Discord. Sprue glue for filling. No good for resin. Yeah. Yeah, I've never tried sp sprue glue. I just, uh, it's, you know, you get into habit of using certain materials. Um, what is uh, sprue glue good at, Wavy? What, how does it work? Like you say you use it for gap filling on plastic models. So is it like kind of a thin, like a glue, a glue type consistency, and then it'll dry and fill a crack or get fill a gap? Oh yeah. Yeah, pet hair is crazy. Oh yeah, tool making classes are hard, Twisted Oma, at ReaperCon because um, they usually involve some pounding and noise. And the last time we did them, um, there were complaints from adjacent classrooms. So we do have to be careful about that uh, because it is unfortunately noisy. Like Andy Peeper has also done a tool making class and he uses an actual small anvil. Um, but it was very loud. And after that, people were like, none of that. Um, so yeah, that's the problem with tool making classes is that they can, they can disrupt, uh, people on either side or in the same room in the case of Reapercon where we're running two classes in one room. So yeah, so there we go, guys. Nice and smooth. Any other questions? Dog's blessing must touch all things. Yeah. Sprue bitch. Mel oh, interesting. Miss Dimp. Sprue bits melted in plastic glue interesting that's weird yeah i wouldn't even know how to work with that like i could i could see making really irregular textures with it would be really good so yeah so there you go yeah this was a fun one i i didn't know i had as much to say about green stuff until i started talking to you guys and then suddenly this turned into green stuff so okay so tomorrow guys we'll do rust of rust and corrosion effects. We'll do, um, I the wrought, wrought iron for the central pillar and we'll do uh, orange and red and brown and purple rust for that. Um, and then we'll come down here and we'll do some bronze, uh, and do some green and blue vertigree out down there. How does that sound? Maybe even some copper. Well, maybe we'll do copper instead of bronze, but it's more likely to be bronze. So there you are. All right, let's plop back up to face. Oh no, I forgot to, okay. Well, you guys are going to get paint splooge again. Cause I forgot. <laughs> And I will regularly forget to deactivate her intro. Yay! So yeah, tomorrow we'll do the painting. Um, and do the that way it lets me show you guys how to do iron. The e the easy like answer is adamantium black, but I'm gonna do it NMM, cause uh, you may just want to paint your iron and not have it actually have that sheen to it. Um, so we'll do that for sure. Uh, and I don't know. Then I might NMM the little skulls too. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Depends on if I can unearth all my metallic paints. <laughs> uh, all right, Justin, do we have a uh, raid for us? Yes, I'm actually looking right now. Oh, okay. Well, keep chatting, chat. If you have any other questions, um, I'm going to make notes. Now is the time. Yeah, now is the time while Justin is searching for somebody that we can raid bomb. Ooh, what about uh, some oil painting, Anne? Do you like oh, that idea on yeah. some canvas? Oh, canvas oil painting. You know I love 2D art. And I even dug out yes. my oil paints the other day. So, And that and that is not unapplicable, guys, actually. For color, uh, like color ideas, oil painting can be really good. And also, they use glazes, and they use underpainting, and they also do wet blending, obviously, because they can, right? Those evil oil painters. They can wet blend to infinity. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah, I would love to see some oil painting. 
That sounds fantastic. Alrighty. This guy is painting a portrait, it looks like, oh, of wow. uh, Sylvanas from World <gasps> of Warcraft. So Ooh, that sounds super fun. Let's go watch that. Let's go watch that this instant. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Remember, tomorrow we will do our uh, painting, rust, and corrosion effects. All right? Have a great yes. day. Thank yes. you guys for coming out. And don't forget, uh, Miniature Monday is later today at 3 o'clock Central. And uh, hey, you said we. How you doing? Or Anne, I should say. <laughs> but uh, other Anne. <laughs> yes. And uh, thank you guys very much. I guess I'll see you this afternoon. Spread the Reaper love. Let yeah. the, tell this guy about minis. I'll, tell these other painters about minis and about how much how much fun they really are to paint. Canvas yes. painting's great, but miniature painting is awesome. So. Yeah, it's totally mini paint to relax. <laughs> All right, Thanks, come back guys. and see Josh at three. Bye, guys.